Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. Um, we've been doing this for almost 13 years, and uh, that represents over 650 interviews. If this is new to you and you'd like to check out some of the previous ones, go to batgap.com, B A T G A P, and look under the past interviews menu. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it, um, there are PayPal buttons on the website and a page which offers alternatives to that. My guest today um, is Victoria Ukachukwu. Um, she's a trained scientist with a PhD in organic chemistry from Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, uh, mother of two daughters. And uh, she told me earlier that her name, was it of God or word of God? Word of God. Word, word of God. Of, so yeah. Chukwu means God okay. in the Nigerian language. And uka, uka, uka must uka. mean word of, right? Uka means word. See, it's the, the, there's no off in there, but it means the off is implied in the first uh, in the first part of that uh, construction. That's uh, that I word. See. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so you came to my attention. I forget exactly how there was some. Uh, some email or something, some web page that I stumbled across, and I saw you listed there with two or three other people, and I read a brief bio of you, and you know I thought, well, she would be real interesting to interview. And um, unlike most of the people that I've interviewed, you haven't done YouTube videos, you haven't written books, you're not a professional teacher or anything, but um, that's we like people like that on this show because one of the original motivations for starting it was to show people that you don't have to be some kind of special person uh, in order to be spiritually awakened. That, In fact, the subtitle of the whole show is Conversations with Ordinary Spiritually Awakened People. And that's the impression we're trying to convey, that this is something for everybody. Um, it's not extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It's everyone's birthright in a way. So I'm glad we found you. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Um, so I got an impression from the bio you sent that um you know for most of your life as is the case with most people you identified primarily with your you know normal human identity you know your your marital status your profession your training um you know things like that and um you said in your bio that over time this identity began to feel very limiting and you began to have questions about god and the nature of reality and science wasn't answering those questions for you, neither was uh, the Catholic religion in which you were raised. And uh, then in 2010, which will be 12 years ago now, you discovered the teachings of non-duality, and uh, things really began to blossom. So maybe you can take it from there and, and tell us how what happened, I mean, how, how things proceeded. Mm -hmm. So as you, as you noted, um... Uh, you captured it quite well. I um, up through graduate school, actually part of going to graduate school was uh, to answer some of the questions that came up for me as uh, about uh, reality and the nature of our, uh, uh, of our existence here on earth. And some of those within the domain of science, um, uh, I've, I would say I got some answers, but the larger question as to, you know how you you have a question, it gets, it gets answered, and then more questions come up. It gets and more questions come up. So um, I grew up a Catholic, I was raised a Catholic. And so of course I had the, the strong belief background in, in God, in a God, uh, and in a God that is somewhere called heaven, <laughs> called heaven. And um, and I would often um, plead and pray and beg and petition this God as, as issues came up for me. Um, but I think it came to a head once I finished graduate school and I was having some personal issues, you know, relating to marriage difficulties, uh, difficulty in, in my marriage, which later ended. Um, 
And, and I felt like at this point in my life, I should be able to handle whatever came up, right? Solve any problem. Only to realize that that was just the beginning of the restlessness in terms of feeling like I really don't have any control over anything, over at least of all my life, much, much more the, the universe questions about the universe. That's when I started, uh, I became, I became curious, right? And one of the, one of the first exposures I had was a book about on the nature of reality that was published by uh, uh, Jane, who, who channeled Roberts, Seth. Jane Roberts. Jane Roberts, yes. Right. I don't know how I came across that book. I came across it in a library while I was still in grad school. Nature of reality sounded really fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> but I read the book. I think it was a, a, two, a two sequence book, volumes one and two. Uh, I, I, to, to be honest with you, I had, I had no idea what she was talking about. It just, it just went over my head at that point in time. So I put it aside. Uh, grad school would have been 19, I'm, now I'm talking about 1985 to 87, about that time when I read this book. And I put it away and got busy with, with professional life and raising my, two, my daughters. Then in 20, 2009, uh, there, were, there were, I had real challenge professionally. I'd been, and I'm not going to name the institution. I was a chemistry professor and I became, went into administration. And then there was a merger. It was a big, big merger, right? That upended everything. I had been there for a while and thought I was building something. And that just threw me for a loop. And many people laughed and I pondered, should I stay, should I go? But anyway, I'm not going to get into all that. I say that to say that that was what really drove me into seriously asking, what is this all about? At this point, having done all this, I thought I had, I had done everything. They said, if you did that, you would, you would make a good life for yourself, right? None of that, none of that didn't happen that way. Um, that's when I... Um, when went back, and I'm going to say this, I went back, I went to a, to a bookstore to look for a book on the nature, on reality and God, right? And as I was looking through the, 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 uh, a bo the books, a book fell. <laughs> and the book was The Presence Process by michael brown he's not well i don't know if you know i've him. heard of him i don't know much about it's, him but i've heard of him it, it, he's from or i believe originally from south africa and it actually fell off the shelf it fell off the shelf and 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 then I, I i go to pick it up because i thought i had knocked it down i go to pick it up and it says the presence process and and i looked at it i'm like what is the presence process so i started flipping through read the introduction the introduction about what was about he had some health challenges serious health challenges that he overcame and this process was describing how he overcame it and the introduction was well done because he was he, he was the, he was emphasizing the fact that it doesn't have to be a health problem it could be any challenge that this is the way to find the answers that you were seeking. Wow. I'm like, that's what I was looking for. And I, and I picked up the book, went to pay for the book. And it had some, it, it apparently was a used book, which I didn't know. So the cashier starts to ring it up and say, oh, I see it has some markings. Well, since it appears to be a used book, you get it free. Oh, that's nice. I, I just um, want to add that there seem to be little elves that hang out in bookshops and not <laughs> books off shelves, because this isn't the first time I've heard somebody say that, that they're standing yeah. there and all of a sudden this book falls off and it's exactly what they needed, you know? I, I, I unbelievable. believe it. So that, that's why I took it. It was a process. And right now, in retrospect, it's really, it introduced me to meditation. That was, it, 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 he didn't call it meditation. It was just a sitting uh, 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night, right? And basically, before bed, basically what it was is 
be still. No matter what was happening, be still, right? But anyway, so I did that. I followed the process, finished it. But here's the interesting thing. He warned that if you follow this to the end, uh, something unexpected may happen. Don't be alarmed. Don't do anything about it. Don't go running off looking. Don't be frightened. And sure enough, I wake up one morning, I start limping. There was no physical, no obvious ailment, nothing. I felt like an ankle strain. I was really limping on one leg. I'm like, oh. and I'd be prior to that, I had no issues at all. No, no leg issues, no health problems. So I remembered what he said. I said, okay, I'm just going to watch it. Ordinarily, I would have picked up the phone and called the doctor and got to see a doctor. I did not do that because he had said that, especially I didn't fall, I didn't bump into anything. So within three days, I continued the meditation. Within three days, it cleared. So what that did was gave me faith in what he was sharing, okay? That was the first, my, my first foray into... Um, into into this spirituality stuff. spirituality otherwise it was just uh catholic go to church and pray right so i finished his presence process and um uh what I, I, I the questions kept coming to me which which how which way to go which way forward professionally i was debating whether to stay where i was or move right and i kept and so incessant thought uh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And then as I was, um, I, one afternoon, I was just sitting on a couch, you know, one of those lazy afternoons, you're not particularly doing anything, just, and thoughts are coming and going. And it was about, what do I do? What do I do? And then this clear, here I heard clearly, be more, do less. Hmm. Rick, you have to understand, I had, at that point, I, had, I knew nothing about non-duality or spiritual teachings. So, I, so then that became my obsession because it, it was a voice. It wasn't a thought. It was very clear. And I said, and I saw the question was, be more, do less. What does that mean? I'm, I'm not used to not doing anything. If, if, I, if I wanted something to happen, I have to do something about it. And this, uh, this guidance was in direct response to my question, what do I do? And it's telling me, be more, do less. So then I decided to uh, not do anything and stay where I was and just uh, I, I know, see what happened. Not do anything meaning stay on the couch or in general in terms in gen of your career in, in, situation. In, yes, in term in terms of all those things I was thinking about yeah. doing. Yeah, just be more, be more, do less. So how do I be more? And now you see that came on the heels of doing the presence process. So then I so I dove more into meditation using the process in, in um Michael Brown's book. And that's what I was, you know, and then just to, you know, going about my life uh, normally and letting things be as they are and seeing what happens. I still was, you know, a little bit uh, anxious and concerned about what do I do and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, waiting for guidance, if you will. I'm going to just, you know, do the meditation because that's how I know to be more and see what happened. That's when I, um, a video popped up. In my YouTube, I, you know, I was on YouTube and I see this video with, um, I forget how many million views, okay? Just, just the number of views. And it was um, the, the, the Laughing Buddha. That's the title of the video. And it was, uh, that was the first time I, I, I heard of Muji, that video. He was with somebody and they were talking about something. I don't even remember what it was, but they were both laughing uncontrollably. So, and then in there, there was the a caption that says, to learn more about non-duality and meditation and how to access uh, uh, your true, uh, 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 something about accessing the, the, the true self, which is the source of, 
our everything in our lives go here. So then I went and um, I went to his website and saw some more meditations. And then I started trying those. This was in 2010. Uh, nothing much came of that, but that led me to your website because you had interviewed him. That interview was on his website. So then I said, okay, let me see what this is about. Let me learn more about this. So I came to your website and that's where I found, it talked about the self and all that. And all of that was all new to me. I'm like, what is the self? What is that related? Is that part, what is God? What, you know, more questions, right? It's like new, a whole new language that I, I didn't have, didn't understand. And I set it aside. And then I uh, think about a year later, that's how I discovered your website. And I would just look and see what's uh, in any video that looked interesting. And the next video that I watched was an interview of Rupert Spire that you did. Uh, and that would have been a year later. And uh, he had written a book that I think the, the transparency of them, I, I, maybe I'm not getting the title correctly, but I'll tell you this. That interview was, to me, it, it felt like contentious <laughs> because he was talking about there is no matter. Matter, matter meaning ma like physical world. Yeah, phys yeah, physical matter, right? There's no yeah. matter. And I remember distinctly you saying, what do you mean there's no matter? this trash if i don't take out the trash in my house my <laughs> wife is gonna get upset with me this is real <laughs> but i was kind of i was i was agreeing with you because as a chemist what do you mean there's no matter <laughs> chemistry is about the study of matter right its properties and, and structure then that got me uh attracted to rupert spira if he so were to say I, that to me now i would probably say well you're right and you're wrong. There is and there isn't. And it depends on what level of, of yeah. reality we're, we're talking about. But yeah. anyway, go on. <laughs> but I mean, he 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 was not yielding an inch. So his conviction, you know, for me was like, how how can he be so sure of what he's talking about? I want to I want to know exactly where he's coming from. So I went and bought the, the, the books, his books and read them. And what that did for me was, all right, I really need to talk to this guy. <laughs> I want to talk to him in person. And I, then the next retreat he's, he had, I went to his website to see events that, he, he, that were coming up. And he had an event in 2012 in Maryland, which I went to, a three-day uh, uh, retreat. That was all I could afford to do at that time, So in terms of time. So I went to that and um, that was very interesting. He, and he, he did, he, sh he shared his, um, his yoga meditation. And one of the exercises he had, he, he, he asked us to perform was to raise our hand without effort. Just let, just, just let it go up. Initially I'm like, how is it gonna go up without effort? <laughs> but anyway, I followed his direction and midway, I had I had a most startling experience. It actually I felt like my hand was moving independently of me, like something else was moving it. I did not finish that retreat. I thought, okay, that's interesting, but why? What what happened? I could not explain it. And and he he explained that a lot of times we think we are doing things, but it's the it's the energy of being that be, that it's being that is expressing and then the idea of a sep an identity a separate self comes in and usurps that and claims to be the doer that was new to me too so i resolved that i would actually now go to a, re a full retreat with him it was not, and it wasn't until two years later so that I could it was in the summer he had a retreat in the summer that I could attend all the others were during the academic year because um, I couldn't take time to go and that retreat was in Connecticut and now I'm, I'm in 2012 so I went 
I shared a room with somebody, and uh, at the beginning, the first three days, uh, I kept I kept saying to my roommate, "This is very boring. <laughs> all of the, all of the everything he's talking about is already in his book." I think you know I, I I and I went to his retreat in Maryland, and he's just repeating what's in his book. But on the fourth day, each each time though, when he would do the the, the meditations, right? The, the, what he calls the yoga meditation. But on the fourth day was when um, I guess I snapped. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Um, I can't even, you know, it's hard to describe, but all, the best way I can describe it is we was talking about leading us through an exercise about being aware, being aware as our true nature and, and uh, 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 directing us to to vision, to feel it, to go, you know, how he does those exercises. And in the process of going into uh, uh, the, what, you know, what he described as aware, um, awareness, the infinity, the infinite nature of awareness at the level of the mind uh, is felt as the body, and the eternal, eternal nature at the level of mind is time, space, and time. But anyway, he so he he asked us to go into a into to feel it, to experience it directly beyond the intellectual um, understanding. That's what I saw. So, I, so I, at that point, I think I just relaxed the the mind and just curious about what what it is I would experience. And I just remember feeling um, like, you know, something that was very contracted suddenly expanded. Like, uh, unbelievable. It was like, there wasn't, it wasn't an explosion, but a, a huge release, right? And I wasn't there as an identity. All I remember was just being aware of this this expansion, right? It's a huge sense of exhilaration. Like, you know, it's like, wow. But I didn't know what it was. It's just the feeling, the incredible feeling. And I'm thinking, after it, I'm thinking, being aware, is that what I just experienced? There was there was nothing else other than that huge release. I call it a t- all, all tensions gone. The body was just kind of limp. Um, and it just felt wonderful, just wonderful. Nothing mattered. It seemed like this is this is all. This is all. I don't need anything else. This was this was it. So at the next uh, session, I. Um, what I noticed though was, I felt like I, I, I no longer felt closely identified with my body. My body felt like now there was a distance between what I wa- what I am and my body. Like I'm observing that even the thoughts were like things flowing through after that. So at the next. Um, when we had the next meeting as part of that retreat, I, I asked him about it. And he, he said that, you know, I'm so glad that uh, God, I received his guidance at that meeting because he, he, he encouraged me to just let it be. Don't try to understand it because the mind is trying to understand what happened. The mind cannot understand what happened. Don't try to recreate it. Uh, that that was just the that what I had just uh, experienced was a glimpse into true nature. That that was an experiential knowing, a direct knowing of it, and to just let it. And then this was the most important thing I got out of that. He said, "Let it, observe it, and let it reveal itself to you." And that's what I I did. 
Uh, three days later, the retreat ended, but I was the, I was on such a high. I'd never been that. I've never been that ecstatic in my life, <laughs> never. Um, and now, you know, people talk about the influence of that. I've never taken any uh, chemical things that make people high. That was unbelievable. And, it, and, and but he told me, he said, eventually you're going to come back to, you're not going to stay there. You, it will, it will, it will unpack itself at its own time, but you need to let it and just be with it and let it uh, reveal itself. Okay. So then I'm like, okay, I'm just going to be aware. That's my job now. Be aware. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So uh, the retreat ended, came back, drove back to New Jersey, uh, had taken a, a, a two-week vacation from work. The first week was for this retreat. So the second week, I was home. Thank goodness I took that time because that second week, I, I finally understood what Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle meant by sitting on, on benches, except I was in my, in my living room. It, 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 I can say I felt incapacitated, but not physically. There was no desire to actually do anything, do anything physically, but there was contentment. If something needed to be done, there was no thought about it. I just got up and did it. That, that was a big difference that I saw. I began to notice that I'm like, wait, things just happen without forethought, right? And I was still able to function and do the things that I knew how to do or, or needed to be done. But, but there was just the overarching desire to just rest. And I wasn't tired either. So at the end of my vacation, I was starting to get a little worried. It's like, I have to go back to work. I can't, I mean, I can't go to work and just sit at the desk and, and, make, and watch things happen. <laughs> but that's exactly what happened, believe it or not. At the time, I was, uh, I was an administrator managing a number of programs, academic administrator. So I go back, I come into my office, it, it looked strange. It's like, what am I supposed to do here was the question coming up. I didn't forget anything. I still remembered everything, but it just seemed meaningless. And it's like a tri- trivial, right? The things that loom, like, seem like all important, it's like they, they were no longer, they didn't have the same level of importance before this experience. So then I uh, followed the advice and just remained aware, observing. Basically, I was very observant, watching. And I would actually, the the biggest thing was that thought, I wasn't engaging thoughts. The thoughts that will come about, you need to do this, or this needs to be done, or you need to call this person. I wasn't engaging them. But what happened was things that like, like I need to do, if they came to mind, right? The activity, any relevant activity was done. Let me explain. If it's something I could do by myself, I did it. But if it's something that required uh, engaging with another uh, person or other people, uh, I found what, what, what would happen is I would, I would reach out to a person that I thought was relevant and miraculously, much of the resistance that I had encountered in doing similar things in the past, I wasn't encountering them. And, I, and then I would think of somebody that I need to talk to and they, they, they will call me, right? Or somebody I need to meet with, they'll send me an email. I need to, you know, can we meet to discuss? So that's how things started to happen, more effortlessly. And that's when the realization, it began to dawn. And this is, I think this is part of the revelation. It began to reveal its, its nature to me is being, being more and doing less. It meant being present. 
just being aware, being in presence. And in that presence, there is an intelligence that organizes and orchestrates things. And then the activity will follow. It's, it's effortless. It's more effective, more efficient way. And for the first time, it's like I'm not, I wasn't, I find that I was not stressing out about things. I wasn't planning too much. If you know, if you know academia, it's about planning, like months in, a, in, in advance. Uh, there's some of that, but only as needed, as relevant. So that's, 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 uh, that's how I came into non-duality. And from, from 2012, I would say, uh, uh, until now, it, it has been me now. I feel like the, this, what I call this presence, uh, this awareness has been my, has now been unfolding itself and revealing its nature. In, 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 any questions get answered before I even ask. And, and, and miraculously, all those questions I had dissolved. It, it, it was like I understood, or I knew the answer, right? Uh, including one of them was, what, what is God? People, it goes by different names, presence, awareness, consciousness, uh, the self, Brahma, you know, what is God? And so I'm going to stop there because I've been talking a lot. But from 2012, with that experience of direct knowing, I would call it, of uh, a true nature of being aware and the, and the, and the release of the identity. What I, I call it, a, a, a identity-free being being without identity, you know, you, I, I still, I, nothing changed about me externally. I, there are still those characteristics that I would have, that would have identified me, but now there's no ownership of it, right? There's, um, there's just the functioning, there's just being, pure being. And it's, I'm like, why didn't I know this sooner? <laughs> could have saved myself a lot of uh, headache but that's so that's and in that process um i've come to also realize that it's 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 an unfolding process it it there's it's infinite you never get to a point where you say okay i i've got this its nature is infinite uh it's uh oh, the incredible wisdom you know intelligence that it is so I, I you know i i kept telling at the time i was still with the meditation room and i kept telling them i said i can't believe how simple this is i can't believe how simple it is but it became simple after the experience not prior to the experience that i had you know so that's that in a nutshell um is how i would describe my experience to uh, realizing uh, uh, true nature, which is I call identity-free being, you know, being without identity. Well, that was beautiful. In fact, the the coherent way in which you unfolded that whole thing was, I think, symptomatic of the deep level from which your mind functions uh, and the you know the spontaneous um, nature of your behavior now as a result of this awakening that that was really clear um I'm good i'm glad yeah, yeah a few little thoughts that oh go ahead what are you gonna say no it's uh it's uh I, I call it the miracle of being of our being you know it's like we cannot it's not you it, it when it's known it's by being it you know it you cannot describe it as there's something other than you, you know, so. Right. For some reason, as you were saying all that, I was reminded of that verse from the Bible of my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, you know, come come to me, all ye who are heavy, who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Um, and it's like we shift into a more natural way of functioning, which is just more restful by its yes. nature. 
you know, do less and accomplish more. Yes. I mean, well, I'm glad you point you 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 uh, picked up on that because in uh 2019, so if I can continue sure, yeah. <laughs> this unfolding basically is that is an unfolding now for me. In 2019, I came across um a teacher Paul Paul Gorman, he's British. Yeah, I don't think, you know. I hadn't heard of him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he. Well, I came across because I was on Amazon uh, to order a book. So, you know, you search and they show you titles and all Give that. Give you other suggestions, yeah. And the title came up, Awareness Itself is, this, is the Secret, right? Mm -hmm. And I read the introduction, sounded interesting. So I bought the book, read it. You know, at, at this time, you know, it's like there's now spiritual discernment. I can, I can, you know, uh, see what's resonating as truth for me. And most things, I just leave them alone. But this one caught my attention, and I, I read the book. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was good. It was interesting. But he led me to Joel Goldsmith. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned he, Joel. Yeah, he led me to Joel Goldsmith, and in it, first when I started reading uh, the Infinite Way, I think was his the, the his the seminal book, uh, Joel Goldsmith wrote. But and he's using he's couching it in the in the biblical terminology. Initially, I was turned off because I, as I said, I was raised Catholic. But I had questions about people fighting and killing each other for in the name of God, right? <laughs> so I, you know, so at, at a point I got turned off of all religion. But so reading his book, he's talking about the Master, which is Jesus Christ, right? Even though he himself was Jewish, so was Jesus, and so was exactly, exactly, <laughs> and that's the that's precisely the point. But, um, and of course, he's talking about the same things, except using, using this, um, uh, different terminologies. But I was actually, I was actually uh, picking up profound things, profound meanings or um, um, esoteric meanings in some of the biblical passages. And so I started, now I, now I got hooked. He, I was really fascinated at this point to see, okay, because he was saying that the Bible um, contains all the secret that it, of if if anybody really understood what what those passages in the Bible meant, that we would understand the secret to harmonious living. So I was curious. I'm like the Bible. I know as as I you know growing up. We read the Bible cover to cover. So, so that anyway, and then I, I read some of his books. I think I sent you the Master Speaks uh, by Joe Goldsmith. Yeah, I didn't read it, I'm afraid, but you did send it. Yeah, and I've listened to some of his stuff in the past. I, yeah, I think there are some recordings. But that's my favorite because in there he talks about the conscious um, realization of the presence of God. And that, oh my God, it was like, wow. Now I find somebody describing what the what I have experienced, like able to capture it as best um, as possible. And his whole thing is that to know God aright is life eternal, right? Before that would have been just a biblical passage to me. But he went, it goes on, and I understood it now I, from what he wrote that uh it's to know to know our true being is to know god he who and i think there's a saying who, who knows himself his himself knows his 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 god his lord it was some quote uh, somebody um a, a quote attributed to one of the um uh teachers and then he unfolds from there 
how this true nature is really an issue of non-dual non -dual being. Non-dual being, meaning there is not you and God. There is just being. There's just being, you know, so. And that's the, so that's the third, uh, the third uh, author in the series that, that uh, of the books that I have read. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, you know, if um, if there was you and God as two separate things, then I guess God couldn't be omnipresent because he's somehow separated yeah. from you, yeah. you know, <laughs> he's yeah. over there and you're over here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, if God is omnipresent and we can explore what that really means, then, you know, I and the Father are one. Yeah. Um, yep. That's uh, exactly. And again, <laughs> it's funny how how words oh my goodness words can um the interpretations are just endless right sure <laughs> endless i initially when i would read those that 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 statement it would it would refer to an identity that i am yeah jesus the man you mean was this yeah. spe special guy who was w one with god exactly not a, not anybody else and... not anybody else right okay well then then and then in his book joel goldsmith points out that it wasn't just jesus jesus was saying uh, it applies to everybody right but then i'm thinking okay so i and god are one it, it didn't quite you know it's it, it took me it took a while to to come to an a realization that when that I is expressed by being, by the pure being, it's an expression of pure being, that's the I that is one with God. It's the same as he that is within me is greater than he that is without, right? Have you heard that one? That's another part. The same thing that he that is within me is greater than he that is without, meaning the he that is within is the is the spirit the spirit of god is the is is is, is god um and he that is without who would that be you see that's the the what i what i call it now is a functioning the expression right the expression when when things are happening like i'm talking to you now anybody knows me or oh, victoria is talking to rick but it's simply an expression expression um within this within within this one infinite being appearing as rick and victoria having a conversation yeah so we might say the ocean is greater than its individual waves right? waves yeah yes waves yes. are these little things the ocean is this vast thing yeah yeah you know so and i and i will actually that reminds me in my what I would call my Christian prayer days, right? You know, like I would dutifully kneel down and pray to God. I was uh, during that period, a tumultuous period, had to do with uh, work, my profession. I remember kneeling and saying, you know, show me, can you, can you, can you, can, can I hear you talk to me? I want to talking to God now. I mean, show me your face, show me, which so that I know that it's you directing me. I want to, I want clarity. You know what I got? You are my face in the world. Mm. <laughs> like but it, it, now, now it's like, I, I say, thank you. But at the point, it, at that point, it puzzled me. So it's you like, mean even way before all this awakening stuff, yeah, you yes. had that prayer and you got that answer. I got that answer. That's interesting. <laughs> And I think I did not know. I'm like, I am, how am I God's face? <laughs> you know, I, because, because of the identity, it just, it, it's, it's like, that's the separation. It just separates you and, you know, and you, and you can no longer, you can't even see how you could be related to God especially for with my Catholic upbringing. Uh, we are all sinners and, you know, 
uh, some of us may not may not be redeemable, right? <laughs> but but <laughs> can't be so, recycled. <laughs> can't be recycled. But but that was that. That's what prevented me from hearing that. The, what from understanding what that meant? You are my face in the world. I love you know? that. That's really neat. Yeah. So I've never forgotten that. You yeah. know. And then I think looking back, I've had these these uh, messages, but didn't know what they meant would you um is your interpretation of what that what you now know that to mean such that you could also say that all of all people and all animals and all trees and everything are god's face in the world yes yeah you know, the, uh, you know again i'm going to go to the bible i do have this christian background <laughs> which is why joe goldsmith's reference in the bible intrigued me the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yeah. That, that's a biblical past, uh, uh, quotation. It, it, see, I think the religions came and sep removed God from the world. And what, what do you have left when you do that? Yeah, you have, have some big puppeteer in the sky someplace yeah. so so yes everybody everything yeah. you know science talks about animate and inanimate right mm -hmm. uh, there's just there's just the consciousness it's just the 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 uh, you know the words words fill fill me sometimes the levels of or the degree of unfoldment or the degree of illumination as uh, joe goldsmith will say of each thing but there's any any appearance appears in this magnificent presence yeah. right uh, and here's another thing right it's like the most the funniest thing to me is uh, i think i think i i've heard you say this uh before enlightenment chop wood carry water it's an old zen uh, saying yeah, uh, yeah yeah i heard it from one of your interviews and i'm right. like and then after and enlightenment after chop, chop wood, wood carry water, carry wood. so <laughs> in my experience it's like the same world trans is now transformed into the temple of god mm. right uh, it's 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 like before before the um realization it was a world of strife and all that after the realization this is god's heaven yeah it, it, it so the seeing changes and some people might be thinking well what about ukraine what about somalia what about you know all these horrible things that happen and yeah there's the well i'll let you comment on that i have some thoughts you know that's ahead. that that's that's the uh perennial question right mm -hmm. uh does god you know punish the why does god allow wars why does you know the holocaust how all that I, and and that that bugged me for a while where i am with this now is where in this harmony the presence of god implies harmony right strife and i use my experience as an example i was efforting a lot in my life before the realization of true my true nature of being after that it was it was more harmonious it has been more harmonious and less less strife and uh because we always reference our experience I am. I, I would. I want to suggest that the same applies to the world at large. Uh, in the presence of God, where uh, where the I, I, I want to quote this. Where where the presence of God is, there is liberty. Liberty. Free, liberty. Yes. Liberty. Okay. Liberty. Freedom. You know, harmony. So those things are those are afflictions I, and I, and I, and i'm not implying that uh, anybody is or any group of people are uh god that god is not god god is omnipresence we have to start there uh, everywhere at all times but we must recognize that 
we must realize that actively engage and realize that presence in order to to experience to experience its pre th th that presence the the effects the nature the the attributes the properties of that present it it has we have to actively recognize and engage you know it's like uh i think one of christ's saying is you sh ye shall know the truth and the truth will set you free it didn't say the truth will set you free the truth the truth exists but you have a part have in to it to know it you have to know it that's what i that's so to me it's a, it's a similar in, in response to your question we have to acknowledge the real the, the 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 presence of god or god's being as a reality of our being and then the miracle happens yeah because it already exists god is not with god god is not withholding peace for example in ukraine or in Russia, or in parts of Africa where you have strife and all that. This is there. It has to be activated. And how is it activated? By people like you and me and everyone recognizing the omnipresence, the omnipotence of God. We cannot be believing in the, we cannot be relying, I should say, on physical force to, 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 to solve our problems. Uh, and at the same time saying God is omnipotence, right? The one power. So if you have if you have that, if you have two powers, then you're saying God, you, you want to use the power of God to overcome so-called uh, evil, right? And then we set up the polarities. We set up the polarities. You put out the fire here, it comes out here. Because what we have done is established a premise where you will always need to use one power to overcome another. That that's that's where I that's how I see that now. It's um, um, the, 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 the people in those of us in the U.S. are not. We're not immune from the, the challenges of war and all that, right? Let me put it, no, no, no group of people are, um, are uh, more susceptible to it, to, to strife and conflicts and all that. It's really the degree of to which uh, we recognize, each person recognizes the presence of, of of uh, the omnipresence of God in that environment. And I don't have to be in Ukraine to realize that God is present in is, is, is the space of Ukraine, the community, the you, whatever, you know, the country, that God is there too. Uh, whether we're in there physically or not, we can, we can all, um, I have activate is the best word I come up with. Well, we can all um, uh, uh, see that as an as as being present in uh, for the people of Ukraine and the people of the world throughout. I tell you, this is this is this is the challenge because I sometimes I'm watching TV and I see all these horrendous things with kids and all that, and I see my energy going down. You know, especially you give money, you feel helpless. There's, what can you do, right? But what really, what really, uh, what I find very helpful and effective is to not to not allow the conflict to register in consciousness, because by 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 keeping consciousness clear. Like I said, being in presence, allowing that intelligence to direct. You know, I find that at least in my personal life, it, 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 it uh, directs in harmony, whatever action is harmonious. It may be, it may, it may, it is never a perfect state of harmony, but it may be more so than it was. You know, so to me, the difference is the conscious recognition and realization of the presence of God at all times, everywhere, 
and in all situations, no matter how bad it appears, because that's how it gets transformed. And you may not be the person who does it, but but just that can can uh, what do they say? Uh, ten, ten conscious people can liberate a town. I forget how it's. Uh, you, you know, yeah, there are statistics about you know percentages of meditators. Uh, yeah, in a community, and then the re reduction in crime rate and all that. Yeah, and and wasn't there some whole thing in the Bible about you know if there are so many righteous people in this town, I yes, turn that's, it to that's ashes what, or something, Sodom and exactly, Gomorrah or something. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, and yeah. um, that that's what I was referencing is that we can all do something, right? Yeah, and and here's the thing: one of the questions, you know, this is related to this. One of the questions that came up for me is, wait. If everything is God, if God is omnipresence, what about evil? That's what you asked me. Did God is is evil of God? And one day the answer just came in, you know, in, in my contemplation and meditation. It's like if you see evil, you are not seeing God. So if you see evil, your work now becomes to bring to 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 bring God bring God. You know, God, I use God, you could say presence, awareness, whatever term works for you, to bring God into the picture. Right? And so what you have done is, so the responsibility, it's almost like the seeing of evil, you help, we help to keep it going. That doesn't mean close our eyes, don't see it or deny it. No. Once you have seen it, it's in consciousness, you also have to resolve it in consciousness. And once it's resolved, it, it, you resolve it in consciousness through, again, the conscious recognition and realization of omnipresence, then right action arises. It, it's not about being passive. It's about the right action, harmonious action, uh, uh, and, the, and, and, and reclaiming or restoring the, the, the peace, the peace of the presence of God. So that's 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 um, that's that's how I see it. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix said, "When the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace." Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's well, very well said. Very yeah. well said. Yeah. You know, I was uh, thinking about your your experience as you described it, pre and post awakening, where during pre awakening, you know, you were working hard trying to figure things out and things were not always going well and you couldn't figure things out and there were probably clashes and frictions and and this and that and then once that awakening happened all of a sudden you found yourself making the right decisions doing more with less effort mm -hmm. and you know probably more harmonious in your relationships with people yeah. um there there's a couple of verses in the gita one is established in being perform action and then another mm. one, another one says, um, being or yoga, me meaning unity, consciousness is skill in action. And mm -hmm. then there are verses about doing more with less effort and not claiming the ownership of action. Yep. And if if you're not claiming the ownership, then kind of like cosmic intelligence does everything and, and you can just enjoy the ride. Um, yeah. Yes. So you're, I mean, everything you described is reminiscent yeah. of. It, it, it's amazing. And this is somebody with that had no background at all with uh, yeah, well, this is Hindu, you know, uh, perennial um, truth, you know. Yeah. And I will share something. My daughter, my younger daughter just reminded me of this the other day. She said, uh, it was last year that I almost drowned. Whoa. She she's um, she she's um, in Michigan where she goes to grad school. And she had gone out to Lake Michigan with her friends on one. And I was sitting, I was home in, here in New Jersey. And uh, then I get a flash of insight. How's, how, her name is Chi Chi, how's Chi Chi doing? And I, I talked to her often, but I hadn't talked to her that week. I said, how's Chi Chi doing? And then immediately the next thing that comes up is, uh, she is safe and secure in presence. Okay, that's just the thought. And then, and then I pick up a phone and I call her, and she's and then she answers. She goes, "Mom, 
I'm okay. I'm okay. Everything is okay. I'm like, what do you mean? What, what's going on? I'll call you. I'll call you. I'll call you later. So I put up my, I, then I said, okay. And I went back to what I was doing. About two hours later, she called me. She told me that she had gone boating with some of her friends. She's, she's, she's a good swimmer. And uh, the water seemed uh, idyllic, you know, still. I, I think Michigan lakes are notorious for that. They look, they look uh, deceptively still. It is a big lake, so the waves yeah. can get big. Yeah. yeah. And she jumped in, and her friends were sitting, and, they, and then one of them happened to look at her, and she looked like she was not okay. And she said, Chicha, are you okay? She goes, no. I can I keep I keep trying to swim, but I, I can't. It it just keeps pulling me away. I keep trying to get back to the That's so like the current or something. The current. And then so, one of them said, Oh my God, she's the best swimmer here. So two of them jumped in and then carried her, like carried her back. And in the minute, so as soon as they brought her, it sounded like when they that conversation was happening she gave me the about and that was when i picked up on her i know is she okay but then instead of panicking what i did was you know leave you know basically because i'm here in new jersey the, all i can do like i say is, is in consciousness to um establish her safety in the presence around her and so she and and so she then she was telling me I, now then she was telling me the story and I'm getting I'm I'm like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable you know so things like that that those kinds of communicate I you know I can't tell you was it the awareness of that that helped or did I what happened there this is a pure intelligence in action. Yeah. All I, I interviewed can say. this guy, I forget his last name, his name was Stephen something, and uh, he's a hospital, he works at a hospital on Long Island. But anyway, when he was in college, he uh, some stranger offered him a ride on his new motorcycle. And so he got on the back of this motorcycle, and the guy took off, and he was going you know, well over 100 miles an hour down a rain slick highway. And you know, he really thought he was going to die the way this guy was driving. And finally, and finally, he came back and he got back to the dorm at like two in the morning and he's walking down the hallway. Think, oh, my God, I almost died. And, and the payphone rings on the wall and mm -hmm. he, which is unusual. And he never answered the payphone. But he, since he was walking by it, he picked it up and it was his mother. Stephen, are you OK? Oh you know, gosh. I just woke up and I, I, I was afraid that something was happening. To you. So th this kind of mm -hmm. thing. You know, yeah, <laughs> you know, Rick. That that's a thank you for sharing. That's really, um, that's really fascinating because one of the things that I've also come to realize is this: we always think that miracles have to be these big, dramatic happenings, but it's the it's the it's the quote unquote ordinary experiences that we have, and I've come to realize that that's the way. It is supposed to be, right? But we've we but it but we've we've come to rely more on tools, on objects than the direct link, the direct communication. Which you know, tools are helpful, but we have to use them in their proper order, just like the mind, right? The, the thoughts have their place. You know, I, I was talking with a, a friend the other day, and. Um, his question was, "Do you so? Are you saying that the mind has no place? No, no, the mind has a role, but its role is not to direct. <laughs> its role is to implement. It's a tool. If it, it's a tool, you know. So, and when it is functioning properly, it it, it is brilliant. It can be brilliant. And I have to say, this reminds me of my um, my." Um, Work my work as a scientist as, as a chemist. I remember, you know, the, the the chemistry. There are so many elements, right? Out of which all the, the various com combinations and permutations that create the different object materials that we see matter, right? 
and uh, you know, science, science again is science is exploring within the realm of the physical, within the realm of what I will call the expressed, right? The, 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 well, I, you know, again, and you know, we can we can we can get into the the boundaries between physicality and energy and subatomic and all. And you keep you can keep you can keep drilling down to you know where you there's really virtually nothing, but they come together and do something that can be measured and captured with an instrument. But this realization actually for me uh helped me to to see science in its proper perspective in its proper role and 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 which is makes it more interesting you know but before as the one thing as long as we're using tools invented by mind right through the mind it will have its limits but the limits don't don't define the limits of reality, you know. So that that's 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 like oh that that's exciting. But within that within that limit, there's a lot that can be done, you know. And once we hit the barrier, or once we're able to overcome the limit, a, a, a particular limit, then look at look at what's happening with technology, for example, you know. So. So I just wanted to add that that it, this is so amazing that it, like I said, all the questions dissolved. It became that's just a knowing. It's like I, prior to that, I would question, how do people know this, right? <laughs> but it's just when you're attuned that that based on your own um, capacities and. Uh, um, training and abilities and all that, the, the information will come through the same channels that you would normally uh, get them, but you'll be surprised at how much more you can access, you know. Uh, one, somebody once said that, uh, real, you know, what we can observe, obviously, what we can observe through the senses are very limited. It's like taking an infinite dimension, right? and trying to squeeze it through the three-dimensional. Uh, yeah, here's an example. If the, if the Mississippi River were, the, were to represent the spectrum of electromagnetic, yeah. the electromagnetic field, then visible light would be a few centimeters somewhere around Keokuk, Missouri. <laughs> yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. You know, so, so material, our sense, what we're able to sense, does not uh, begin to, and and sometimes it's not sometimes it 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 somehow it has to be interpreted. There's some distortion there, right? So it's it's not necessarily uh, um, um, a, a, not a, a perfect reflection of reality, you know. So you know, it's like now in retrospect, I see why I was fascinated by science because of all those questions and now to find out that the answer actually lies beyond science right um uh it is 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 in and of itself uh, uh, a great benefit of this so and and here's the thing i think that <laughs> the funniest thing is that we are all this everybody has is this whether you know it or not that that's that's the great love, you know, the the, the the divine love. And it's there, just waiting for the recognition of it. Yeah. You know. Uh, but the conditioning, um, I think the the biggest challenge is the sense of identity. That is that is just the biggest, biggest uh uh, I think uh, 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 obstacle, but the thing is, you can have all that. You can still have all everything that you had identified with, just in personal. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to own it. You know, uh, I, I had this conversation with one of my uh, friends at the meditation group. We were we went to a diner after a meditation, 
and I was sitting down and he says, Victoria, what do you mean no, no identity? How are you sitting down in that chair? Isn't that somebody sitting down in a chair? And I said, Bob, I don't need to be a person to sit down in a chair. I could just sit in a chair. <laughs> That's just sitting. <laughs> well, why do I need to have an identity to sit down? You know? Well, language uh, is very much structured in terms of identities. You know, in fact, yeah, when you yeah. when you answered Bob, you said, "Well, I can just sit in the chair," and he might have said, "Well, who's this I that you that's sitting in the yeah, chair?" Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> that that, but that's the I. That's the personal. He's thinking of a personal I. Right. I'm thinking of the universal I. Right. This, Do you, that's think a, you have both a personal and universal I, like well, wave, wave and ocean kind of thing. <laughs> Ah, well, that's a really good question, uh, Rick. Um, yeah. we, we, you can have complete total identification. And all you know is that personal I, right? And then, the, then the, the degree of unfolding or realization, you begin to lose, I think they call it dying daily, right? Releasing some of that. Um, and it is, you know, depends on the degree of, of release, right? You can release that, but if you're asking me personally, yes, there's, there's, there's still some identity, but not as much as it was. It was, it was suffocating yeah. previously, right? right? And, and then it's continuing to decrease because then the more experience you have, the more it's like, it's actually fun <laughs> that other people can still see you as that but you but you're not responding that way you know in my in other words you're not coming from that uh, identified place less and less i find that i'm able to i don't need it it's it, i'm actually more effective that way yeah. you know um and in and you know it's easier with, with in if you're with a community of people who who understand that but if you're in, out in the say in the workplace where not many many people um are, you know have this type of understanding um I, you know you just keep it quiet i just keep it quiet and perform from that space and they respond and sometimes they're surprised at their own response. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> they're, they're, they're surprised. And then they try to give you credit. They, they try to personalize it again. And I'm, I'm quick to say, nope, it just happened. It just happened, you know. But I'm happy to be the, the space of it happening, the conduit, if you will. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a happening. It's just a a functioning if you will yeah yeah i have this friend who's going through a real profound spiritual awakening and you know she's having a hard time with personal pronouns because they just seem so inappropriate to her, her experience of herself you know mm -hmm. and uh and she's trying to figure out like how to talk mm -hmm. uh because without seeming like a hypocrite yeah and, <laughs> and uh I, I think I might have, well, I don't think I did, but I perhaps should have quoted, you know, Jesus and saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, and there's this uh, concept in Advaita Vedanta, which is that um, they call it Vyavaharika, which means the transactional level of life. And then they mm -hmm. have the other level, which is Paramatmaka, which is the true self. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's understood that in, on the transactional level, you just behave normally and it doesn't mm -hmm. invalidate or compromise the, your mm -hmm. realization mm -hmm. um just as let's say you you know you go into a pottery shop and and you wouldn't say there's nothing in this shop but clay even mm -hmm. though you'd be right but there are mm -hmm. pots you know mm -hmm. or a jewelry shop you wouldn't say there's nothing here but gold mm -hmm. even there are no necklaces there are no rings there are no mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh, that would be true in a way because it's all gold but it's also not true because on a relative level there are these you know the the gold or the clay have been formed into things right you know I, right i mean words to me i think I, I, yeah i i empathize with your friend and her and her quandary <laughs> <laughs> but for, for me 
it, like I said, there, there was a there was a, a distance. It was like I'm watching that yeah, personality. Yeah, that pro- character. It was I became a character mm-hmm. in the same thing with the thoughts, right? They're no longer, they're, my goodness, it was incredible. The thoughts had such a stranglehold. Such a grip. On, a grip, yeah. So, so that distance happened naturally. And it never came back to, so I, so it's okay for me. You can say Victoria. I know who you're referring to. It wasn't me. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not my true self. That's, that's how I feel about it. So I'm not going to, whether you want to call it a he or a she, it's okay. You just, I know, I know what you're referring to. So, but I, yes, I can totally get that, you know, um, and um, and that is why sometimes when you see people talk about spirituality, there's almost like a, um, semantics. So it, sometimes it can devolve into a semantics, right? Because of that very... Uh, the invite uh, to shuffle, like you're sitting at lunch and someone says, please pass <laughs> the salt. And, and you say, who wants the salt? You know? <laughs> It gets kind of nauseating, but <laughs> no, uh, yes, exactly. Oh my goodness, I remember uh, one of those videos. I don't remember. I saw it on YouTube. I don't remember. It, oh, was it around, a cartoon kind of thing? Uh, no, it was. Oh, okay. It was a teacher saying, "There's nothing to do. You do not exist." Right early on, you do not like you know, Tony Parsons or somebody. Yeah, yeah, you know, you do not exist. There, there is uh, nobody here. Right, yeah. uh, nothing to do. Oh my God, that was. I mean, true, but <laughs> <laughs> but like you say, in the in the functional uh, experience, right? Yeah, it becomes a little challenging for people to be able to communicate. Jeff Foster made this really funny cartoon thing that you can find on YouTube. I think it's called the Advaita Shuffle, but it was based on an experience he actually had with his mother when he was in his Neo Advaita phase. And they're walking along through a park and his mother says, oh, look at the beautiful tree. And the the Jeff cartoon character says, there is no tree, there is no beauty. And it it goes on for about 15 minutes with this. And by the end, his mother says, you're no fun anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that I that can happen, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But um the 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 terminologies also can be can be overwhelming, you know, like the different terms consciousness, awareness, yeah, presence, God, self, right? And it's good to clarify what we're using, what we mean by the words. Yeah. Otherwise, we're not going to communicate. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah, clarification is always a uh, is always a good thing. I was thinking about what you were saying earlier about how your life became so much easier and smoother and more efficient after this awakening, and uh, and we've been talking about the state of the world and so on with wars and famines and all those things. Um, I think that if awakening became a more universal phenomenon, then um, the shift in quality of life that you experienced and the ease with which things happened that were meant to happen and uh, desires were fulfilled effortlessly and so on would begin to be experienced on a societal level, you know, and then we wouldn't have all these famines and wars and conflicts. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. I think, is a, I see it as a threshold thing, right? Yeah. The certain threshold in terms of the illumination of consciousness. Like, uh, it, it looked to me, it's really a matter of decluttering consciousness, <laughs> you know? Right. Decluttering, decluttering. It, with all the stuff that we, concepts and ideas and notions about reality. You know, um, uh, you know I, I told somebody, I say, you know, it's really as simple as, Either you know something or you believe it, right? If it's not your direct knowing, you need to be looking at what you're believing, right? So so there's a threshold of consciousness or conscious awakening, however you want to describe that, 
um, we will see that shift. That, that you know there is a shift in energy, and you can look at all the stuff that has happened in 2020 and all that. Um, I, I tell you the 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 murder of George Floyd. Oh mm. boy, that really shook me to the core. Yeah, it shook the whole world in a way. Whoa, talk about where is God? Yeah. <laughs> but the most amazing thing happened. And watch, I couldn't watch the whole video, but I forced myself to watch as much as I could to watch it and just in presence, consciously watch it without judgment. Just observe what's happening. Uh, it was easy to empathize with George Floyd. It's very easy to, to, to have compassion with him as quote unquote, as a victim. I don't want to say quote unquote. Um, but what about the the officer? Derek Chauvin. Derek Chauvin. What about him? And so in just watching, something came up. It's like the question was, wow, what happens to a conscious being to bring him to that point, to be able to do that? You know what Jesus said? He said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they, they do. They know not what to do. And in that instant, it was like, like you, like you, there was very little light yeah. in that presence, in that being. But, but it's there. It's just, it's just blocked out. And that's the only way you'll be able to do a thing like that. And then it shows up at a society level on the level of society here as racism and discrimination yeah. all the people stuff, who are all exactly. blotted out yeah you know and so everybody is a victim it's interesting that you should bring this up because just this morning i was so i went into this little fantasy about what if i were there you know when derek chauvin was kneeling on his neck and i was i saw myself kind of going into action and saying sir do you realize that you know you're killing this man and you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison snap out of it you know mm -hmm. <laughs> take your knee yeah. up it's funny i just went into this little reverie yeah about it. <laughs> yeah well that that that's that's interesting this, again it goes back to conscious action if you're coming from presence just the you know the light with the full light of consciousness right you can spring into action yeah. but if you're heavily conditioned those officers standing around did nothing did you see what I mean? Yeah. Well, so they too, to whatever degree or, or so, were incapacitated. Look at the guys in the Uvalde, um, you know, Rob Elementary you School, know? standing in the hallway for an hour. So, so this, I mean, it's like bringing, elevating the light or the the, the uh, conscious, the level of consciousness in the world helps everybody. Yeah. Right. Think of it Ever. as like a, a forest, right? Where the the soil is all dry and the, the trees can't draw any nutrients. So all the trees are just going to be withered and gray. But if if the soil gets a lot of rain and it's nutritious soil, yeah. then all the trees flourish like the rainforest, you know? Yeah. So yeah. society is like that. I think if if consciousness is not really oozing into collective into the it's, it's expressed values very easily yeah. then everything is yep. such a pale shadow of what it could be but and, if, and if, it, go ahead and, yeah. and it and it affects everybody yeah exactly quality of the perpetrator it's, and the 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 person against whom this is done you know yeah. that's um it's there's an there's a field actually and it and it any everyone contributes to it and then everyone is influenced by it yeah um and so yeah. the more we enliven the field by awakening our own consciousness, the more others have an, a tendency to wake up. And I think that that's happening in the world. There's a kind of a collective awakening happening. Yeah, yes. And that also, you mentioned the Ukraine war. I remember when that started and uh, at, a, at a point, um, uh, it's uh, if I, I shared the same sentiment is like how does somebody just leave their country and go and attack somebody else for what for under what pretext right and then uh again presence uh, the this what i call the 
the natural wisdom is like, what comes up for me is, yes, that should not be condoned. But, but when you have good guys and bad guys, right, you're going to continue having good guys and bad guys, right? So isolating, and, and then I think some of it is being born out. Uh, the, the, the world rallied as it should to try to isolate the, the aggressor, right? Um, what do we have? Uh, there could have been another, there could have been a, 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 there could have been access to action that could have preempted the war and prevent uh, suffering. Yeah. There's but I don't know. The Yoga Sutras, it says, avert the danger that has not yet come. Yeah. And of course, Benjamin Franklin said, a stitch in time saves nine. So uh, that, <laughs> <laughs> that's God. You know, and so, but but you see, access to, to that action comes from what I keep calling the recognition and the realization of this presence, which is everyone. You can't exclude anybody. Nobody is excluded from that, no matter, no matter how evil or dark they seem to be, because that's how you actually transform it, you know? Uh, and then when things like that, when it does happen, we say, oh, miracle. Okay, it's miracle from the perspective that we're viewing things. But I think this miracle should be more like how life unfolds globally, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's my... Uh, uh motivation for doing this <laughs> well you're doing you're making listen i thank you for pointing for cooking me up with the <laughs> with uh, the key people in terms of those interviews you did because i don't know how i i i uh it was quite it was quite selective too you know yeah. and after after the the uh, Rupert, well, i think i just put them out there it's your intuition that that yeah. draws you to the right yeah. ones so you're doing a it's a great service. And that reminds me, there was a time, like I said, I was leading uh, meditation and then it just, you know, um, and people were saying, you know, you should start teaching, you start doing this. I'm like, I'm happy to share this as the opportunity comes. But if the teaching needs to happen, I am not going to make a decision about it. It will happen. Yeah. You know? So well, you're doing a good job today. You're very eloquent. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, not I, the spirit I within. Yeah. <laughs> the spirit within speaks. A question thank came you. in from an old friend of yours named Mandy Smith. You may not remember her, but she said she met you at a Rupert um, retreat about eight years ago. She lives in Brevard, North Carolina. And her yeah, question I is, uh, remember Mandy? You remember? I do remember oh, good. her. <laughs> her question is, um, is the release of identity a conscious process? What was the most important guidance for you in this process? Yeah. Uh, is a, the, 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 ah, that's a good question. The, the, the release itself is, um, is spontaneous. It's, it's, it's spontaneous. You just you you just realize that it has happened. It's not something that I, I can't. I, at least in my experience, I can't tell. I can't describe any process to it. But I can I can talk about my interest and curiosity about the nature of reality, of which. Our true nature is one, right? Our true nature is is reality. So, in 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 following those interests and you know trying to have a more un, a greater understanding, you make contact with 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 with, with um, this infinite presence, this infinite being. Once that contact is made, in my experience, it takes over. Yeah. Now, to what degree depends on where you are and what has gone on, and you know. Um, so, so I would not say that there's a that there's a conscious process. Conscious process means that 
as I understand it, that I'm doing something consciously to make that happen. It happens spontaneously, but it happens within a receptive um, being, an openness. There's a receptivity to it. And yeah, and you made yourself more receptive. You were doing some yeah. kind of meditation that you had found, yeah. and you went to a couple of Rupert retreats, and uh, yeah, you yeah. know. So yeah. there's that old Zen saying that enlightenment may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, no, I think to, so. To answer the question, hi, Mandy. The the there's it, there is openness and receptivity, right? If it, you know you, if the truth resonates with you, accept it. If it doesn't, for me, if it doesn't resonate, and again, some spiritual discernment comes in, you let you live it alone. I, I, I in fact, I, I used to, I really used to question and be critical of certain viewpoints about spirituality. Not anymore, because you don't know where each being is in their in their own unfolding right if it doesn't resonate as truth for me as it truth truth is always is eternal right and once it connects it it, it, it uh, connects with a truth within you it resonates and then you be you contemplate it I'm, i was fond of asking questions like what does this mean that means something has resonated but i did not understand what it meant and then, and then it will reveal itself in your own consciousness, and then it becomes your truth. And you can then, and, and then, then it, the activity of that truth in your consciousness will then lead you to what, what is needed for you at that point, you know. So that's, 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 that's my experience of it. It's be open, be receptive, and um and then listen yeah. listen for the guidance yeah you know jesus he said uh what seek and you shall find knock and the door shall be opened um yeah i, th I think so when we when we have that intention we send out a signal to the universe so to speak yeah. you know yeah. and yeah. and the signal gets answered we start finding yeah. what we need to find yeah well you know that's that's really interesting you 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 mentioned this uh that quote by jesus yesterday i think it was yesterday in meditation it's like what are we seeking <laughs> you know seek and you shall find what did jesus mean by that you know because um but he also said the kingdom of god is within you yeah so if the kingdom of god is within you what are you seeking there's a um what is it t.s Eliot poem where he says we I forget how it goes exactly, but we sh at the he said at the end of all of our seeking, we will come back to the place from which we started and know it for the first time. Yes, yes. So, and I answered that question. Is like you know, it's easy to think, and I was, I and I and I was, uh, I did that too, seeking. Oh my God, if I need a a million dollars, seek for a million dollars, and you shall find right or whatever material, whatever it may be. Um, I've come to understand or realize that, uh, you know, seek ye the kingdom of God first. Right, and all else and, should be added unto that. And all else should be added unto that. Because that kingdom of God is this, this is our consciousness, it's our being. Yeah. It's our being, it's everything, it's complete. So it's just, <laughs> I cannot tell you how liberating that is. <laughs> liberating that is the ultimate freedom because nothing in other words all the fears and you know about whatever it may be you know you i you really i i come to realize that if you're resting if you're anchored in your being in that in that consciousness which is the kingdom of god within you what is there to fear yeah how how did you uh, fare during the whole COVID thing? Not that it's totally over, but um, you know, some people mm -hmm. really had a hard time because they they weren't used to social deprivation and yeah. isolation um, and all that stuff. Yeah. But how did it hit you? Yeah, that's a it's a really good question, and I thought about that that people were going to have a hard time. But you know, once I I once I integrated meditation. It's no longer a practice, it's a way of being for me. 
it's almost like it's uh, this is gonna sound funny. <laughs> Activities distract me from meditation. <laughs> I know what you, mean, you know, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like that is the real expression. And in that, all the activities are self-organizing, arranging what needs to be to be done and in what in what order. So during the COVID, I I I, I was fine. It's like um, we we went. I teach and we went uh, remote, um, and many people had a hard time with it because you know again the the, the isolating aspect of it. For me, it was more. It was an opportunity for more silence, more stillness in my, even in my work, <laughs> you know, to be able to, to have more of that because um, it can be, it can be quite noisy. Yeah. Uh, so no, I, I, it, I was fine. But plus also, I, ref I was, I consciously, um, I was consciously aware that uh, the fear of contagion, right? The fear of of uh, infection was worse than the virus itself. I'm not speaking scientifically now. The fear itself, right? I made it got just just degraded people's uh, physical ability to to cope with it I, I i think which is what the vaccine did is it just lowered the the oh, fear the threshold fear, yeah. fear threshold you know and then and it, it's uh it, it, it's it's fascinating it's really fascinating the chicken out the egg right <laughs> <laughs> well it's not a placebo wouldn't have had the same effect as the vaccine did but it definitely helped <laughs> the vaccine did it, that's so uh, i think that it would have been difficult to get people to to fear less without the vaccine. Yeah. The, pan the panic threshold was incredible. And a million but I was people good. died. So yeah. if, if you're afraid of dying, there's there was something to fear. Yes, yes. And um so I because I was um remote most of the time, I waited I, I didn't get the vaccine until it became freely available. I know some of my colleagues were hunting vaccines, right? Like some drove distances to go find. I'm like, why? Yeah, people were flying to Florida. And all kinds <laughs> <of things. laughs> yeah, no, but thank you for asking. I, I was, and um, I manage a campus, and we had to when when we finally reopened. Um, oh my God, I was responsible for making sure the protocols are in place and people. Uh, followed them, and if students or faculty became, you know, it, it, that was the that was the challenge. Is more of um, managing, managing other people, yeah. other people's behaviors, right? Mm. Yeah. You were talking earlier about endless spiritual development, and uh, just last night I I read a quote from Sri Ramakrishna, uh, in which he said something like that. He said that you know, spiritual and there's no end to spiritual unfoldment. Uh, and I presume he meant even after the body dies. Um, but anyway, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, absolutely. That's you know, that's what um, that's what the realization has that's has led me to understand is that it's infinite, and we said right, it's infinite, infinite being. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that infinity itself. <laughs> that there's no end to infinity. Yeah. Right. So, so it's from glory to glory, if you will, from, from, from you know, growth to growth, just ongoing, which is a good thing. I think, uh, to me, I see, I see it as exciting. Now, death. Well, that's another matter altogether. Life and death. <laughs> well, you know, Woody Allen said, I don't mind dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. So you're not going to be, right? You're already not. Gonna. Yeah, kind of. Well, the question <laughs> is, I think we need to be, we, so that's, that comes up is, has anybody answered what is that? We, we're told, well, first of all, some people say they remember when they were born. Yes. Most, most people don't, right? Or they remember before they were born. Some oh, people. before. 
that too. some people is that is that most of the people most oh i'm not most no but not some, most. You know, some okay. people have like you know path yeah. life regression therapy exactly stuff like that yeah so you know i i, I asked that because most of the things we believe about birth, life and death is based on belief, not direct experience, right? right. And, and right now, if unless I know something, I'm not inclined. I don't need belief. Right. Why do I, I don't? Why do I need belief? <laughs> I don't need belief anymore. So, with so as it comes to death, I don't want to believe the 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 cultural mores about it. I call it cultural stories about it. Yes, the image of the but we see the body uh, stop doing what it was doing. Right. I would say of, of of somebody who dies, the body will no longer get up or something, it, it degrades. But the body is a physical, is a physical, um, at the least the body we see is a physical object, right? That material. Uh, but and we know the body doesn't function by itself, right? If you put your, if we put your hand on the if you rest your hand on a chair or somewhere, it's gonna stay there until there's a conscious intention to move it. So that to me tells me that there's something moving, directing and moving, functioning the body. It the body responds to something, right? So when the body stops responding. What happens to that agency that was directing or, or, you know, setting things in motion? What happens to that? And to me, that's the that's what's eternal about being. That's the eternal being, and that's what I've come to realize as my true nature. You know, um, so I do. I do at this. I, I don't want to say believe. I do feel, and um, based on the on the experience of um, expansion, uh, that that essence, that essence is part of the infinity of being, and cannot die. And it's scientific of you to eschew the word belief. Um, I mean. I don't think well i guess scientists believe things but they don't they're not satisfied with with yeah. belief they yeah. they need to have yeah. some empirical verification yeah um and yep. experiential verification i remember oprah winfrey was um, interviewing eckhart tolle and she was she did this little thing at some point where she gave him a couple of words and had him complete the sentence the sentence mm -hmm. and she said i believe and he said Nothing in particular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why do, you, why do you need belief? You know, really. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 experience is 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 can be subjective. Yes, because it's it's your knowing, right? Yeah. Um, but 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 at least you have that. Um, a lot you can see the mayhem in the world that is caused by beliefs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so people killing each other, uh, yeah, each other over beliefs. Uh. Yeah, it's um, but that's uh, sometimes you know I'm in education, and then and I you know I see education as a very powerful tool for transformation, right? And these days, I I keep uh, contemplating um, <laughs> the, the 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 subject matter is important right like you say for the functioning and all that but but is should we be offering a fundamental <laughs> education on uh, and then I'm, I'm laughing because of the 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 Oh, the censorship about textbooks and oh what yeah should be, <laughs> are you saying we should, should have some kind of a spiritual 
development in schools? Is that what you're saying? Well, well, I mean, I use the word, the phrase spiritual development, right, right. by just just a basic understanding of what what we mean when we say I am, or like yeah. who who your 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 nature, your identity. Nobody's going to tell you who you are. You will come to it, but just to point people in that direction at, from the beginning, you know. And then before we start the overlay with all the specialized fields and all that, because you see what's happening. Somebody like me, I go and get a PhD in chemistry. I have to come back to that fundamental, right, to get it because. We accept what has been told us about the nature of, of of human beings and life and world and all that. And then it takes us so far until you hit a wall in your own particular path. And then the question comes, why isn't it working? It's supposed to work. I said it's supposed, you know, and, you know, so I somehow integrating that. But that's a, that's a, that I would love to, to, to to find a way to do something like that. Yeah. I mean, even in psychology classes, you'd think that um, this could be brought in without stepping on anybody's belief systems. Um, yeah. And there are some programs. I, I was actually, the reason I was in New Jersey for six months one time uh, was that they were introducing um transcendental meditation into the public schools and there was a big legal uproar about it because the christians felt like they were sneaking mm. hinduism in and a trojan horse you know <laughs> and uh they ended up having to end the program mm -hmm. but there's some good programs around the country where mindfulness and other practices are are taught mm -hmm. to the kids and it, it usually gets very great results um yeah you know. yeah that's good yes um and the other thing too, yeah, I think you started out in transcendental. I did, right? you, yeah, did, way did, back. I, you taught it, right? I did for about twenty-five years. Uh -huh. Twenty-five years, okay. Um, you know, sometimes I also think that you can meditate for uh, for a million years uh -huh. as a separate identity. Yeah, it's not going to do anything for you much. I mean, you might get some superficial. Um, I don't know, maybe not super, some temporary. Um, well, it thins the veil. It's like I said earlier with the you know, sp spiritual practice makes it accident prone. If if the body is full of stress and tension mm, and impurities mm. and the, the mind and body, it's theoretically possible that the awakening could happen, but it, the mm. probability is less than if you clear the clutter out. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. And that's why Buddha and yeah. various other teachers have always recommended it. Yeah, no, I you listen, it can't hurt. <laughs> I, I mean, it helped that. you, I, you know. I imagine that the meditation you did prior to your awakening led to it, you know. It, was con it, wasn't, it, it wasn't that meditation awakened you, but it set the stage to some extent. I, I agree with that, yeah, yeah. But I also know one thing is the uh, you know, I remember sitting, I remember reading, also reading uh, Rupert's books, Rupert Spiro's books, going to his retreat, and he's saying, oh, my God, my first retreat with him, the three, I was, I was like challenging him. <laughs> How do you know time? this? <laughs> I, I don't think I was, he, he saw it as a hard time, but from my perspective, he was answering them. It was hard. How do you know this? Right. And it, it, now I, I get it. It wasn't, it wasn't he, the, the man that I right. see, you know, is drawing from, a, 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 you know, an intelligent presence. Um, um, but I think that I, I had that curiosity to know where, what is the source of this knowledge? Yeah. You know, that's where, what I was going for, quite frankly. So I don't have to be looking for a teacher. I, I, I think I told you that I, 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 I don't, I'm not a follower. I've never been, but I, but I, but I can, I can take what I need. I remember <laughs> in 2000, I forget when it might've been 13 or so. I don't remember which year, but I went, there was some, some ashram in New York. I, it's close to a shopping center. It would, uh, um, 
that I go to. So I decided I would just go there. There was some guru coming from India and I didn't know. And a friend said, oh, if you're around there, just go up there this weekend. So I did. And I went, <laughs> I'll never forget it. It amuses me to this day. I went there and um, he had a, he had a, his energy was good, presence, right? Like you could feel. And then he, there was this uh, process. You come in and people would go up and genuflect and bow down. Stuff. Bow down, yeah. the feet, kiss the feet of that. So there was, after the initial opening, and then there was a segment where he allowed people to come up and, their master and all that that's just so foreign to me yeah, yeah i was the only one who did not go up and everybody was looking at me like why is she here i didn't <laughs> say that that's but then they came to the question and answer segment and i raised my hand and i said to him i asked him i said this was bothering me a lot i said do you think that the master a student relationship encourages um, dependency, dependency, and duality. Right? His his answer blew me away. He said, "Yes, <laughs> it does." But when the student gets the teaching, that drops away. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you know. You were saying earlier about how. There are many different teachings and teachers, and you don't resonate with a lot of them, but other people may. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I think yeah. that's legitimate. Yeah, reasonable. yeah. I mean, you know, kittens depend on the mother cat. Yeah, that's and, right. Uh, and But at but, a certain point, the mother cat starts hissing yeah. at them when they get yeah. to a certain age and the, to make them leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, again, take what you need. That, yeah. That's what it comes down to. And, and it may be, like you said, for a, a period of time, right, that that was needed and... And then people move on, but yeah, yeah. I, you know, I just, I guess, I've just been um, have an independent streak. There's a question that came in from Adisa Dawes in Palmdale, California. She said, "I get very excited whenever I see guests that have an African name like I do. I appreciate the representation." Question is, how do we love our enemies during adversity? I live in America, and the patience it takes to constantly educate people about social issues gets exhausting, especially uh, since being different affects every aspect of my life. I love myself, and I wish to love, to better love others. Great question. And one of those, uh, you know, tough things to um, to practice, right? We, we, you know, um, hello, Adisa. The... Um, I'm going to I'm going to reference um, uh, a passage a quote in the Bible. Uh, Forgive them for they know not what they do. Right. Uh, in terms of forgiving uh, our enemies, but before we get there, I want to I want to I want to speak to the premise. Once we have established an enemy, it becomes very difficult makes it more difficult to forgive because what that means is that we're saying that this person, whoever it is, we have, um, we've put them in, 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 in their box, whatever box that may be. In order to be able to forgive, we have to see, you know, in, 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 in normal terms, we have to see we have to acknowledge, not even see, acknowledge the humanity of the person. I, even if we don't agree, we, we don't necessarily accept what they're doing. So for me, that's always the premise. I, I, go, I go further, not accepting the humanity, recognizing that that being that we call a person is God's being. And if you recognize that, right, then now you are you what you it, it becomes easier for you to it becomes easier to rec, to also recognize that it's it's an it's it's an error. Forgive them for they know not what they do means that they know not what they do. They're acting in error. It doesn't excuse it. 
It doesn't mean that we should we should do nothing about what's, but what it does is it frees you. You don't it, it frees you from the shackles of uh, upset, hatred, you name it, the negative emotions that come up with that. And I know what I'm talking about because I've experienced it. I've experienced, I have had that feeling before this realization. It becomes easier when I start from the premise that that being is also God's infinite being. So, you know, that being would not be without the grace of God's infinite being. And from that premise, then, then again, uh, the right action, whatever you need to do, will will come and it will be more effective in addressing or or uh, in addressing the situation now, i'll share one example and i'll talk about the george floyd again oh i mean it was it was it that that thing shook me to the core uh and i was just again I, back to how is this possible this is you know what what, what can i do about this and then in, 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 took it in meditation and sitting, and that's where the recognition of the humanity of the of the person doing it, and it became easier to forgive because there's just so much darkness there, and then send some light and see 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 that human see see that being the pure being of that person. He's not acting from that pure being. He's acting from a place of separation from his or her true nature. But the next thing that happened surprised me. Well, I don't get surprised anymore. But it was I was it was <laughs> it was pleasant because you never know what where how that action will come up. I was at a, a leadership meeting for uh, at the school that I, I work, and um, we were talking about plans. But this time, I think it was this happened in May, so around July, August, we had this leadership retreat to plan for the upcoming semester, the fall, as we do every year. And they were talking about, you know, the usual things, a strategic plan, admission, you know, all the stuff we usually talk about. And I'm sitting there, feeling incredibly frustrated, and I did not know why. And this was a three-hour meeting. So I sat there. I did not participate, but, I, but a lot was going on within me. Eventually, the, the, the person facilitating this, who was the, the chief executive of the institution, asked for, did anybody have questions before we concluded? And we're now two and a half hours into the meeting. And I just, my hand shoots up. I had not said a word. I, and I get up and I said, can we have a moment of silence for George Floyd? You have to understand how out of, I mean, it it's came out of, blue, of huh? out of the blue. And, and then at that point, I realized why I'd been so restless. I felt like, how can we just act like nothing happened? At least as far as I was aware, there was no response. And it was, it was well received. We had a minute of silence. I tell you, silence is powerful. After that minute of silence, it opened up a whole discussion about that and what the institution can do. How can we, how can we help our students process it? Okay? And I thought that was the end of it. The next meeting a month later, I was now asked to talk about inclusion, you know, equity, and it's things that, you know, lead to those kinds of behavior, to lead that discussion. And I'm going to make it, make a long story short, it led to all kinds of policy ramifications, right? But I, I, I pull up that example to show that we're not talking about a passive power here. But we have to, we have to tune, and in, tune into it, align with it, to allow that power to express through us. And when it expresses, then you, have, you will address this thing from a place of power, not from a place of anger or weakness or victimhood. 
right? And you, and then your own particular situation and talents and expertise and will then be put to use in the opportunity that you have to address it. You know, so that's what I would offer is that it's it's it, you don't deny anything, you don't bury your head in the sun, you recognize it, you see it. Because in that seeing, you have to see it without the negative thing, you know, that the, 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 the negative emotions that come up need to be released. And you have to resolve in consciousness what, how your role in that whole process, in that whole uh, experience. That's great. You know, we might say that the best way to eliminate an enemy is to make him your friend. And uh, Adisa's yeah. question and your answer reminded me of a story I heard on NPR about five years ago. I just looked it up. Um, I'll read you the headline in the first two paragraphs. He said, the, it's entitled, How One Man Convinced 200 Ku Klux Klan Members to Give Up mm -hmm. Their Robes. Daryl Davis is a blues musician, but he also has what some might call an interesting hobby. For the past 30 years, Davis, a black man, has spent time befriending members of the Ku Klux Klan. He says, once the friendship blossoms, the Klansmen realize that their hate may be misguided. Since Davis started talking with these members, he says 200 Klansmen have given up their robes. When that happens, Davis collects the robes and keeps them in his home as a reminder of the dent he has made in racism by simply sitting down and having dinner with people. Yes. Pretty cool. And that, that's, a, that's cool. That's a really good example. Yeah. And, you know, it may seem like, oh, 200 people, a big deal. Ah, that's a big dent. That's you know? a big dent yeah, for one, they for can one ripple, individual. Ripple out to others, you know. But the more importantly to Adisa, right? Once you have acted from this place of um, compassion, meaning forgiving, first of all, you know, don't define anybody as an enemy, number one. Recognize the humanity, if you will, or the being. Nested. We are all, even in layman's language, they tell us we're all children of God. If that resonates with you, use that. Use that, literally. And then from that, from that position, then, then act, right? W whatever you have opportunity to do, because then you will feel you will be at peace. You know, sometimes it's like this feeling of helplessness that or oh, what can we do or you know they you know you, you feel part of a group that is oppressed i think we can help change that by not feeling oppressed ourselves that's the first step and then move into a place of power not personal power that's the power the power of god within you and use that apply that good to 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 good a question came in from Greg Cannon in Florida. He said, I had never heard of Joel, Joel Goldsmith. Um, what was it about Goldsmith that personally or impersonally enhanced your awareness? Uh, yes, thank you for that. It's, um, it, he actually, that's a really good question. Remember I talked about, I and you, I think you mentioned it and, I, and then we talked about a little bit about the I. I and my father are one, right? That's a quote and I'm not sure the, the uh, questioner is familiar with that. Um, that's a, 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 quote, a statement attributed to Jesus Christ. And, and it was thought that it meant Jesus and God are one, right? Therefore, Jesus is special. But in the same Bible, Jesus talked to us about we are all uh, sons of God, well, children of God. So back to your question, what Joel helped me to see in reading his books clearly was the 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 distinction of the two eyes what he calls the two eyes the universal eye which is the the the, the eye of god the eye of the universal eye and a personal eye like when when i say i i'm talking to rick so I, you know previously may mean to me that i victoria here i'm talking to rick as a person but in in the clarification what joe goldsmith helped me to uh, get incredible clarity about is that there's really just the eye of the infinite being that i'm not a separate being from that that my being is so is sourced in in that infinite being right so that eye is misappropriated 
by an identity that thinks it has its own separate being. So, so, so that the, so that personal I, for me, drew. I remember once saying, "Oh, I does not exist. The personal I does not exist." But if we believe in that, then it's real for us, and that's and that's the the ego, the the false sense of identity that clouds the true nature. So, so that distinction between the universal I, the I of God, the I of Jesus, I, the I, it does not refer to a man named Jesus. The I is, is when it's almost like when the consciousness of being announces its presence, I, but there's a label given to it, uh, Victoria or Rick or um, Joel or Rick uh, or Joel, um, then, then, then you have created a duality. One is false and not real, but it can cause havoc. It can cause, it can ca cause a lot of grief because you think it's real and you start acting on that only to find out that it's, there's only so much you can do with that. But the eternal infinite eye is the true eye of the, in fact, it's not even necessary, but to, re to, to use the eye, but to realize in communication that that eye is referring to, is actually uh, a reference to true being, true, the, the, the source of being. That's, that distinction uh, came clear, very clear in reading Joel's books. And so he talks about conscious realization of the presence of God. I is God. I in the midst of me is God, not Victoria. If you do a Google search for Joel Goldsmith, his website comes up number one or a website about him. I think it's called The Infinite Way. And also uh, if you search on YouTube, I think a lot of his old talks are or yeah. are on there. You can listen to them. Yeah. He died in I, 1964 or something, but a lot of his stuff is online. Yeah. And I'm, I'm amazed that actually what amazes me about him, about his books is, or the, his writings, I should say, how so <laughs> current, <laughs> you know, because truth is eternal, you know. Yeah. He just he just couches it in religious language, but uh, and he was I understand that he was um, a mystic healer too in his time. Yeah, I've, I've always heard good things about him. <clears throat> okay, well, we've probably been going just about long enough. This is a lot of fun. Um, is there anything, yeah. anything you feel like you would like us to have talked about that we haven't? Um, no, I, do, I think I think we've we really covered a lot of ground today. Um, yeah. It just, you know, just, uh, and I know that people listen to these as, at, at, to, to your to your interviews. At least I did, for you know, insights and helpful hints and all that. So in that in that vein, I would just uh, encourage people to, if you if you find yourself um, um, uh, questioning, inquiring, seeking, as they say, um, to just to just um, to have a, a, a receptive um, consciousness, right? Knowing, if you will, be, and, and to, to be open. Um, and then trust, trust that, trust your intuition, trust your insights, trust that intelligence, because it's, it's, it's there. We just, like I said, we just have to release it, recognize it, and thereby release its its expression through us, and it will guide you. You know, I remember uh, um, Krishna Murti. There was something I saw. Well, one of those clips, little clips, like five minute and of of his talks. He said to people, I think he used to have big meetings. He said to them, "If you would just be quiet and listen, <laughs> it will reveal itself to you." I had no idea what he was talking then, but now this is true. This infinite intelligence is within each one. It's just that developing the capacity by, clear, by clearing up the clutter 
still being quiet, quiet, stillness, quietness. Call it meditation, call it whatever you, you want to call it. But start with that five minutes and just listen and see what is received. And it will guide you. You know, that's, that's what I want to just offer and uh, say thank you, Rick, for, for this opportunity. Oh, you're welcome. Um, as you've been a, been a really good guest. I've really enjoyed this. And um, I just want to add, because we had that discussion about meditation earlier, that as I understand it and have practiced it, the whole purpose of it is to allow the agitated mind to be to de-excite, you know, to just mm -hmm. settle down to a state of least excitation, you could say. And then this, in fact, the, the yoga sutras say that very thing. They say yo yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. Then it says basically your true nature is revealed or, or the seer mm -hmm. rests in the self. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a matter of calming down the waves of the, you know, how like a choppy pond mm -hmm. isn't going to reflect the sunlight very well. But if the, if the, if the water is completely like a sheet of glass, the, the mm. sun can just shine off it so brightly that it's blinding, you know, just, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like that way with the way the self can reflect yeah. or not reflect in a <laughs> settled nervous system or an agitated nervous system. Right. Yeah. And then, and again, just to highlight that, that's, I'm glad you, you make that point just to highlight it is to know that it is already within you. Sometimes yeah, it's, there. With the, it's there. And starting with that uh, knowing, that that acceptance, it, it can begin to unfold. Yeah. To, for you. That's really that's so important too. You know, I mean, it, it's it's. I've often used this analogy. It's like we've, in a way, it's like many people are like beggars on the street, and yeah. yet who have actually won the lottery. Yeah, but they they didn't even they, the lottery ticket is in a sock drawer or something. They've forgotten it's there, and so they all have they have this tremendous wealth that they don't realize. So we have this tremendous yeah. wealth within us of mm -hmm. wisdom and joy and, and peace and all that. Yeah, that, that you know, I think in this day of um, experts on everything, right? There's a tendency to look to others for. The knowledge um, yeah. for guidance that that has its place if for me i would just say that if you are led to a person to a teacher yes go like i was right but you it starts with you you have to trust yourself you have to to accept it's acceptance not believe just accept that, it, that it's already within you and that you and that and then you can access it and then you may find a book falling from a shelf while you're in a book uh, store you know and and say here this is what you need or so somebody will just give you something you know but it starts with you you have to open it up what is it uh open up open up uh find create an opening for the imprisoned splendor to escape right <laughs> Forget who yeah. said that. I you forget. Can see it. <laughs> Sounds like Rumi or somebody. <laughs> That's great. And you know, yeah. I mean, you found a good teacher, and Rupert didn't sit up there and say, "I am Rupert the Great, come and kiss my feet." You yeah. know, he basically said, "It's within you." Oh, he was great. I remember. Oh, I'm so glad you. You know, a, a lot of people come felt that he was too intellectual. He's I had kind no of problem. intellectual. <laughs> His voice is so soothing. I whenever I listen to him at the Science and Non-Duality conference, I would fall asleep because I would be tired from the <laughs> pace of the conference, and he would just oh. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, that worked perfectly for me. I would tell you because I like you know I like intellectual rigor, but it was what really really resonated with me was we were in one that retreat where I had this experience. Stuff. Somebody asked him a question about how do you, well, how, how can we see what you see? Like, how can we see, you know? And Rupa said, you know, I see the same things you see. I am no special person. I'm just like you. It, but I've just, I've just come to, I've, I've, that, but I, the difference is that I see, I see, I see things from my true nature. And you can too, you know? Perfect. Uh, yeah, and that that was that was great. Good. All right. Well, that's a good note to end on. You can too. <laughs> you can. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much, Victoria. It was really, really fun. And, uh, you know, let's stay in touch. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for listening and watching, folks. Um, next couple of interesting, next couple of interviews are going to be interesting. Next week, it's uh, Bernard Carr, who's a cosmologist who studied under Stephen Hawking. And um, he's a, an expert on the fine tuning principle, uh, which is sometimes called the anthropic principle, which is how is it the universe even came to be and came to support intelligent life who could actually think about the universe um, as opposed to just being a random jumble of nothing uh, so we're going to talk about that and the following week um, I have um, what's his name thinking aloud new thinking aloud and anyway Irene will get his name but um, he's had this interview show for longer than I have and um, Jeffrey Mishlov, Jeffrey Mishlov. Um, and uh, I think both conversations are going to really be fascinating. So um, come to the website. There's an upcoming interviews page. You can set a reminder in your calendar to be notified of the live ones if you'd like to watch them live and send in questions. And uh, there's an email address sign up thing if you'd like to be notified whenever a new one is posted so that you can go and watch it. And of course, hey, it looks like this year we're actually going to reach 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, um, which is kind of cool. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, and you feel like doing that, just hit the subscribe button. And when you hit the subscribe button, a little bell pops up. If you also click on the bell, then YouTube notifies you for sure whenever a new interview is posted. So thanks for listening or watching. Thanks again, Victoria. Thank and you. We'll see you for the next and one. Thanks Thanks to Irene and your team. Yes, thanks to Irene and our team, she says. <laughs> yeah, couldn't do it without okay. them. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.